It's Lisa from Been There, Got Out, and I am super excited for today's guest. It's best-selling author Julie Clark. I was just reading her book um, like a couple of weeks ago, her, her most recent uh, bestseller called The Lies I Tell. Let me just see if she's in here yet. And um, as I was laying on the couch reading it, I was like, this book is not only so good, but this is the kind of thing that our people deal with all the time. All right, I'm oh, there she is, okay. All right, Julie, I'm gonna let you in right now, one second. So, is it allows you to reach out to strangers, and I just thought, what have I got to lose? Hi, Julie. So Hi, I'm just how are you? Our people. Good, that I, I was reading your book, I put it down and said, this is, my life and our our bigger communities' lives, and I thought, yeah. let me just reach out to you. And the worst that can happen is you say no, but you said yes, of course. So, yeah, yeah I I'm so excited. I feel like I'm I'm able to interact with a celebrity because as a <laughs> writer myself and teacher and like a reader, I'm just like I can't believe you answered. I'm so happy. Like you made my weekend saying that that you were gonna do an interview with us. So I'm, I'm thrilled. And like I said earlier, I think that this book has a huge audience, potential audience in the domestic violence community, because so much of what you describe, even though maybe you didn't intend to write for us, but this is our lives. Like the, this insidious kind of abuse is yeah. what I've gone through. All of our clients go through and our much greater community deals with for a lot of their lives. Yeah. So, um, so like I was saying earlier, well, actually, before, before I even start, why don't you formally introduce yourself? And then I'll get right to my question. All right. I am Julie Clark. I am the author of the New York Times bestselling book, The Lies I Tell, as well as the New York Times bestselling book, The Last Flight, both of which talk about uh, female empowerment. They're about women who are in tough situations, but they're not victims. They're They've got agency and advocacy, and they're trying to find a way out. Um, the Last Flight is about Claire Cook, who's married to a very powerful and beloved man in the country, like a political dynasty second only to the Kennedys. And he is horrifically abusive behind closed doors. And she's made a plan to get out. She has, um, she has assembled a new identity. She knows that you can't just leave a man like him and expect not to have a lot of fallout in her personal life. And so she gets a new identity. She gets, you know, a new passport, new credit cards, new everything, and she's going to disappear. But of course that plan falls apart and he's hours away from discovering what she was going to do. And she meets a woman in an airport bar who is also running from something and they decide to trade plane tickets as a way to disappear. And so the story kind of takes off from there. And then The Lies I Tell is the story of Meg Williams, a con artist who travels the country under assumed names. She creates elaborate backstories to back up whatever lies she's telling. And her goal is to target uh, corrupt men who have abused their power. And she leans into the narrative that the idea that um, powerful men will always underestimate a woman and she takes advantage of them because they do that. I know. Well, that's what I'm saying. You've got an audience, a captive audience here, and it was so satisfying to read, to read the lies I tell, and I'm definitely going to get a little bit the last flight. Okay, so one of the things that also really impressed me as I was reading the book, and we talked about this earlier, was I felt like you did extensive research into coercive control, or you had some kind of personal experience. So can you talk a little bit about what drew you to this, these kinds of topics to write about and how you were able to know them so well? Um, I mean, I did a lot of research. I talked to a lot of women who were in really, really abusive marriages and relationships, I should say. Um, and it's not, it's not limited to relationships with men, unfortunately. Um, and so one of the things that kept coming up over and over again was the, the many different ways that men will take to sort of hang on to their power, you know? And so you see a lot of that in The Last Flight. And then in The Lies I Tell, I flip it on its head where I have Meg, my protagonist, um, kind of out to exploit all of those things that those men do. 
Um, because I feel like in the world that we live in right now, I think all of us are really, really tired of, um, I don't know what happened. Julie was in the middle of talking and then all of a sudden Instagram was like, you're now live. And it was my Instagram story. So I hope that this interrupt uh, interruption hasn't been too major, especially as Julie was on a roll. Sorry, Julie, I'm going to let you back in. I don't know why it did that. Let's keep going. Okay, here, I'm back. I don't know what happened. Okay. What happened. So where did I get to? I wonder if they cut me off because they didn't like what I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm like, you were talking about exploiting, you know, flipping it with Meg and exploiting it and th these men who are holding on to power and, and then it just... Yeah, I guess they didn't like that. Uh, <laughs> anyway, yeah, I mean, Meg takes everything that, you know, uh, my characters in The Last Flight sort of struggled with, and she uses them to sort of, you know, take back some of the power that many of us have felt like we've lost in these relationships that, that we have. Yeah, yeah, I'm, that's what I was saying. It was, it was very satisfying because she does a really good job of it. Yeah. Um, okay, and so one of the things you were saying uh, earlier is these, these women, and I imagine other, other characters that you shape, they feel like they're not getting what they need from the justice system. Yeah, I mean, I think that anybody that's been through the justice system, and especially, I think if you're, especially in like a divorcing situation, um, I definitely think that it can be unfair. I think it can, it, it, it's ripe for exploitation, let me just say. Um, I don't think it's always set up to be fair. And I know a lot of women who have, in particular, really struggled with an, an ex-partner who takes advantage of every loophole and exploits the system to drain them dry, which is what one of the characters in The Lies I Tell does, a character that Meg targets eventually. Um, he's trying to keep his ex-wife from getting anything from him, and he's hiding assets, and he's trying to figure out a way to just drag it out so that she finally gives up. And Meg sees that happening and decides, like, mm -mm, no, that's not, that's not how it's going to work. Right. Even though we don't sense that at first, it, it yeah. seems like the opposite. But I don't want to, I don't want to give anything away. Yeah. So what you know that she does do that. I think it's okay to say that you know she targets corrupt men. Right. 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 So, um, so with that, like, you know, what you're talking about in my world that we call legal abuse and lit litigation abuse, and what you said about how um, dra draining it is financially, that's going to lead into my next question. But all of the people who know us in any way or have been to our own legal abuse support group know that, and I told you this too, Julie, at the beginning of every meeting, we say your ex's goal is to wear you down and to bleed you dry financially. So they use the, they weaponize the legal system to do it. So financial abuse is a huge problem. And this morning on our Instagram post, I put something that was from um, Forbes Women Magazine, and it was an article about how financial abuse is a form of domestic violence. And we know that this affects 99% of abusive relationships. So can you talk about the theme of financial abuse throughout your book? Because that was one of those reasons, too, I thought she's describing our lives. Um, you know, I have several situations in this particular book where somebody is trying to take advantage of somebody else financially. Um, there is, um, at the very beginning, Meg, Meg kind of doesn't, Meg doesn't fall into conning because she wants to grow up and be a con artist. She falls into it because when she was in high school, her mother fell in love with a man who convinced her to sign over her home to him and they lost their home. He basically took it out from under them and she was homeless as a result. And, you know, she, she had a vendetta. She felt like this man took advantage of a woman who didn't necessarily understand how refinancing and real estate worked. And she trusted him and he told her that she could trust him and then did it very deliberately and methodically. And um, Meg really, watched that happen at a very formative age and realized that you know it wasn't just this guy who was bad it's a lot of a lot of people out there are taking advantage of people who are less fortunate or or not necessarily as educated as they are and and so you know it's not just 
it's not just, you know, in partnerships or marriages, it's definitely in any kind of, you know, financial relationship, you have to be really, really careful and trust the person on the other end of it. And so Meg really kind of takes that and heeds that and decides that she can weaponize what she watched happen to her mother um, because she knows that nothing's ever going to happen to these men. She knows that, you know, they're going to keep on doing what they're going to do and they're going to do it again and again and again until somebody like Meg steps in because the, the justice system isn't necessarily going to bother with any of that. Right. And I remember you had said earlier how a lot of times people decide I'm not even going to bother with the justice system because yeah. I'm not going to believe be believed. You want to talk yeah. about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, in my first book, The Last Flight, my main character, Claire, is married to such a powerful and beloved public figure that she knows that anything that she would were to say about him and his abuse would not would ricochet and come back on her. You know, I mean, as a society, we tend not to believe women in the way that we should. And, you know, I was writing that book in the middle of the Kavanaugh hearings, and I just remember looking at Dr. Blasey Ford and thinking, like, why is it that anybody thinks she wants to be there saying the things that she's saying on national television? It's not because she wants attention. Nobody wants that kind of attention. And yet we continue to question and and probe in into these situations that really you should just take at face value. Yeah, good point. So another thing that we got into was um, the types of manipulations with Meg. So she's a con artist and she's very clever at emotional manipulation. And one of the things that I noticed she was doing, you know, because I was trained in this, was mirroring. Mm -hmm. And so can you talk about how she effectively used mirroring um, in the story to ensnare certain people in her life or other things? And um, I think people who don't know this term will certainly be like, Oh, that's yeah. I mean, mirroring is the act of whoever it is that you're talking to or interacting with. You're you're mirroring them, not exactly because that's creepy, but you mirror their their yeah. volume, you mirror the cadence of their speech, you mirror their body language, you mirror their opinions, their ideas. It's definitely used in sales a lot. Um, I mean, it's not always used for you know nefarious reasons. However, it is one of the things that you can do um, and con artists can do to sort of infiltrate your life in a way where you don't really realize that it's happening. You just think you've met this really wonderful, like-minded person who shares a lot of the same ideas that you have and shares a lot of the same likes that you have and you keep the same schedules and you have the same interests. And you know, what's really happening is, is mirroring. Yeah, somebody right. in the comments said it's used in customer service too. It absolutely is, you know, when, yeah, definitely. Right, and I think the feeling is often, ooh, I've met my soulmate. It can be, yes, right. it can be, you know. Yeah. And so, you know, you wonder why these women in the world fall in love with these con men, you know. It, it has a lot to do with those, those individual people recognizing a deep need or a desire in somebody and then convincing them that they're the only person that can give it to them, you know. And that's exactly what Meg does. She targets these men, she finds out what it is they want, she figures out what it is they need, and then she makes sure that they believe that Meg is the only person that can give that to them. And then she takes everything from them and leaves. You know, yeah. because because she does it in a way where she's not stealing anything. They give it to her willingly, mm -hmm. which makes her hard to prosecute. Yeah. Yeah. So I love how it's flipped mm -hmm. that way. Um, OK. And so this, I think, is going to be a rich and possibly provocative conversation because we're always arguing with our clients about it. And that goes into this whole thing with finding a victim, finding a vulnerable person who's a ripe target for this kind of manipulation. So we often beg our clients, do not post your stuff on social media. And they say, but I have to because I want emotional support and I want validation and I can help so many other people. And we're like, I know, I know, I know. I, I, I get it because that's what I do for, for my business too. Um, but it's a little bit different because they're putting themselves in a very um, vulnerable position. So can you talk about how Meg, through social media, uses somebody's vulnerabilities to get her next target? So Meg uses Facebook almost exclusively 
because that's where you can get the private groups, the secret groups, you know, which have people in them who, who, and, and I'm in several secret groups. So it's not like secret groups are bad. You know, I think that secret groups can be a great way to maintain a community of people across the world. Um, but I would say that, you know, if you are in a contentious, litigious divorce, the last thing you want to be doing is sharing your information, your ideas, your thoughts with, you know, your, what's going on in your case. What are you struggling with? What are you worrying about? What is your legal strategy? All of those things, because you really don't know who's on the other end of those profile pictures. You really, really, really don't know. And so Meg has infiltrated a divorced parents group and she is under an assumed name, you know, and she, um, she is reading all of those posts about everybody's divorces. And I mean, it's like a gold mine for her. And she has figured out that that's a really great place to find men who deserve her friendship, shall we say. And she finds a man in one of those groups. She, she at first is reading a post from a woman who's really struggling. Her husband is very powerful, has a lot of money. She's never worked. She stayed home. She took care of the kids. And he is dragging the divorce out and dragging it out and dragging it out. Her credit card debt is through the roof. She doesn't have a job. She barely has a place to live. And things are getting worse. And there's no settlement. There's nothing temporary put into place. And she's really struggling. And Meg is like, hmm, who's that guy? And so she figures out who his, she looks him up online. And then she finds his sister and befriends his sister so that she can get into his circle and start targeting him. Um, and again, her goal is long overdue consequences. Right. And I liked how you also said she gets in through the sister you had said earlier. It's like she goes in sideways. Yeah. She doesn't ever approach anybody head on because I think everybody in the world that we live in today is a little bit like if somebody comes at you hard to be friends, you know, a new friend and they come on too strong, like that can be a little um, suspicious. And so what she does is she befriends somebody in that person's circle first and becomes a trusted confidant of that person. And then when she's able to meet her target, she's got a reference. You know, somebody can vouch for her and say, oh, yeah, no, she's great. She totally helped me. Yeah, she absolutely. Does it that way again and again and again. And she uses the Facebook groups to do it. Right. And that's the thing. So Facebook groups, even though they're private, they are often infiltrated with toxic, manipulative people. And again, our community, yeah. be warned, like those people are trolling through there, too. So if you can't I mean, see who you're talking to, you got to be yeah. careful. I think, it depends. I think it depends on how big the group is. I think it depends on how many of those people you are actually able to meet in real life. Um, I mean, I do think that there are ways to vet it because having gone through a divorce myself, you absolutely need your community. You absolutely need to be able to talk to other people. And some of the most, the best friends that I have are from that time in my life from one of those groups like that. Now, but, but, but the caveat is that I was not going through a contentious litigious divorce. I was not, it was painful. It was hard. It was abusive in a lot of ways emotionally, but it was certainly not something where I needed to, you know, I needed to be very, very careful in the way that a lot of your clients do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> very different. Um, okay. So the other thing that we talked about was I had asked you if you had ever heard of Malcolm Gladwell's book, um, talking to strangers. I know he's, you know, he's another best selling author. He's done things like blink and the tipping point, but in talking to strangers, he's described the concept of default to truth. And the, the reason that really resonated with me is it means that we, we normally think that somebody that we don't know is telling us the truth. Right. So people in our community and everywhere, it's human nature to say, I, I feel like an idiot that I was in this toxic relationship. There were red flags in the beginning and I didn't pay attention. I should have paid attention. I'm so stupid. But Malcolm Gladwell's default to truth explains that, that people don't walk around being cynical like everyone I meet is probably lying. We do the opposite. So can you talk about how this theme applies to your story's characters as well? 
Well, I mean, I think that it, I think that it's an important thing to keep in mind as far as always, always giving yourself the benefit of the doubt, right? I mean, I think we've all gone through things where we've ignored red flags and, you know, we've wanted somebody to be somebody other than what we were suspecting they were becoming. Um, and so, you know, it's that saying of like, I did the best that I could at the time with the information that I had. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, I, I think in my books, it's never about it's never about blaming yourself. I, I, I feel very strongly that the women that I write on the page are strong, um, competent, you know, they, they do make mistakes. They do ignore red flags. They do, you know, partner up with people maybe they shouldn't partner up with. But at the end of the day, like there's no blame, there's no one to blame when something bad happens to you, except for the person who did the bad thing to you, right? Like you can't really blame yourself. My other character, Kat, Roberts has a hard time with that. She has a hard time, you know, not blaming herself. She blames Meg, but really the person that she should blame is actually the person who inflicted the pain and trauma on her. Yeah, yeah. That kind of goes into my next thing that we talked about when I said about helplessness. Like often people feel helpless, not just in the story, but in life. But um, in multiple characters in The Lies I Tell, they move from victimhood into empowerment, which is exactly what I said to you earlier too, that that's, that's what, how we want our people to feel in real life. That even though you know our greater community is mostly dealing with this crazy family court system and they feel like they're at the mercy of a judge and who even knows what kind of mood that person's in, yeah. there are things that you can do. There's actually a lot of things that you can do to feel empowered and to not feel like a, a victim. So I was going to ask um, how you can apply that to this story or also just elaborate on how you write your characters that way, because you talked a bit about that before. Um, you know, I like to create my characters. I always want to make sure my characters have some kind of growth. Right. And so, you know, it's never very interesting for me to read a book where the characters are pretty much the same at the end of the book that they were at the beginning. I, I feel like you don't really get invested with people unless they're struggling and learning and growing alongside you. And so, um, you know, creating that character arc takes some time. You have to think about where, where are they started? What's their starting point from the moment the book starts? Not necessarily like their origin story, although that's important for me to know as well. I need to know all of the traumas that they have had in their lives. I need to know all of the good things, the bad things, the mediocre things that have happened to them so that, that when it comes time for them to be making decisions on the page, that informs the things they say that informs the things they do and so you know i try to make my characters as three-dimensional as possible and the most important thing for me as far as character development is figuring out what is it that i want this person to learn at the end of this which is generally what i want you the reader to learn at the end of that too you know at the end of a book you want to be thinking what is this book really about what is it that the author really wants me thinking about and you know people have asked me that in book talks and I'm not going to answer that question because you have to read the book for yourself and, and find that and we can, I'm happy to discuss it with you after you've read it. But, um, <laughs> but, you know, I think that characters have to have a deep, deep want, but as the author and as readers, you need to be able to identify pretty early what their actual need is. And a lot of times those are two different things. A want and a need are not the same thing. And so a character may want something, but what a character might actually need is something completely different. Yeah, and that makes me think about the question that I brought up earlier, like, should we talk about it or not? Like, is Meg, okay, so Meg is a con artist, mm -hmm. but she's not really a sociopath, is she? No, I would like to say she's not a sociopath. I mean, I think most con artists are sociopaths. I just want to put that out there. I don't think that, you know, you can think about somebody as a con artist and like think you can be friends with them and nothing bad will happen to you. I think most con artists are gonna take advantage of anybody, anywhere, any way they possibly can. Um, but I do think that I, I wanted to write a story about a character who is doing the wrong things for the right reasons or at least the right reasons in her head, right? And so she's all about, you know, balancing the scales and, you know, the, the justice system isn't necessarily going to have the time or the inclination to do this. And many of us don't have the patience to wait for that to happen. Um, I think the world we live in, we're waiting for a lot of that to happen and it's just not happening. And so Meg Williams has gotten sick of it. She's tired. She's going to go out and she's going to balance those scales on her own. And 
my goal was to write a morally gray character like Meg, who you know she's doing bad things. You know that what she's doing is illegal and not good. But at the same time, you're rooting for her. You still want her to succeed. And some of that is because of what she's doing and who she's targeting. And we all want to see those people get what they deserve. But some of it also is because you have a deep understanding of where Meg came from and what she's gone through. And so while going out into the world and being a con artist is maybe not what I would recommend as a life path for anybody, um, I do think that we can still be on Meg's side. We can still be rooting for her and cheering her on and wanting her to succeed in this very narrow path that she has created for herself as a way to sort of get the justice that she thinks people deserve. Right, because we can have such tremendous empathy for her. Right, right. I mean, that's the goal is that when you create a character, um, you know, I mean, and there are books out there with lots of really unlikable characters, but you have to go into it knowing that you know, that's, that's what the author intended. And my intention was for you to, to not hate Meg. I wanted you to love Meg and, um, and root for her, even though what she's doing is, is morally wrong. Right. And it's interesting because I think readers will find they don't feel the same way about Meg in parts of the story. No. I mean, I think that, you know, you'll go into it and you'll not be sure. And, and, and the truth of the matter is, um, you know, there's another character in this book who it has equal weight to Meg. Her name is Kat Roberts, and she's an investigative reporter who was collateral damage on a con that Meg pulled many years ago. And she blames Meg for putting her on the path to some very serious trauma that completely derailed her life and derailed her career. And Meg is partly to, f to fault for that. Um, and so, you know, you're really not sure who to trust. Kat's going to infiltrate Meg's life. She's going to bring Meg down. She's going to expose Meg. Um, and, and it is a cat and mouse story where you're not really sure who the cat is and who the mouse is, and you're not even really sure who Meg's true target is. You know, Meg is an unreliable narrator, and she's not unreliable because she's mentally ill or she has substance abuse problems. She's unreliable because she doesn't want you to know what she's thinking and what she's up to. Like, there's a reason why she doesn't want you to know. So you, you go into it knowing that she's not a trustworthy person, and yet despite all of that, you still want her to succeed. That's okay with you. Right. And what also is interesting, which you just touched on, is that that cat who is who at the beginning of the story sets out to really expose Meg finds herself really drawn to Meg. Yeah. Like it's almost as though she can't resist. Like her brain knows this is a con artist. I have to be really careful. I know her history. She's already hurt me indirectly, profoundly. Yes. But yet, I still feel like she's my best friend. Yes. I mean, I think that's, you know, I did a lot of research on con artists. And one of the things that they do is, you know, a lot of the mirroring and stuff like that. And Kat's aware of that. She knows all of those things. And yet, you know, I think when you're around a truly gifted con artist, it almost doesn't matter. They're dynamic. They're engaging. They're exciting. They have great stories. It doesn't matter if the stories aren't true. You know, you become enthralled in sort of their world and their reality. And so, you know, I think that anybody who has been a target of a con artist like Meg or Anna Delvey or anyone else will tell you like, oh my God, it was awful. But like, boy, was it exciting when I was, when, when I was living that. Boy, was it exciting. That, that makes me think exactly of the romantic relationships when someone gets involved with a narcissistic type and they yeah. are being love bombed and it's amazing yeah. and they feel like, okay, even though this person did terrible things to their ex, I, it's going to be different. different. Yeah. <laughs> no, you're not. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And so I think that, you know, I think a lot of, I think a lot of con artists are also like deeply narcissistic. And so, you know, I wanted to make sure, I wanted to really make sure that, you know, I wrote Meg in a way where we could sort of, squeeze between a lot of these a lot of these very typical like diagnoses for lack of a better word that con artists would have narcissistic you know personality disorder um you know all of these things like meg meg is not any of those things i mean maybe she might be a little bit of a narcissist but but i don't think very much i don't i don't think so yeah i don't think so. That. but what was what was really fun too as a reader is because we start off with cat and her perspective that we're on that emotional roller coaster where it's like I don't, I don't even know who I'm rooting for either. Right. Like here I feel one way in one chapter, and then I 
feel different. And so I'm questioning myself. So we're feeling it right with the right the narrator, which is yes. It's I mean, really fun. Cool. That was the yeah. goal. Is, is you, for you, you did it. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm a picky reader. Oh good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Julie, I don't want to take up more of your time, but thank you so much for, for talking to me about this. I saw, I don't know if you saw some of the comments earlier. People were like my new favorite book, or I just finished it. I loved it. Yeah. I'm glad to hear that. I'm really glad to hear that. And you know, this is a, this is, I was telling you in our chat this morning, this is really a demographic that's near and dear to my heart. Having lived this, this life, having gone through this, walked this path, um, I'm here on the other side to tell you it gets better. And so keep, keep doing the work, keep doing the next thing on your list. You know, don't think about the big knot of things you have to do to unravel a relationship or a marriage. Just think about the one next thing on your list that you need to do and just do that. Yep. Great advice. Okay. So what's the best place to either get a hold of your books or support you? Um, pretty much anywhere that you can afford it. You know, if you need to go get it at the library, get it at the library. If you know, um, my preference is always independent bookstores, independent bookstores are near and dear to my heart. They are the bread and butter of our publishing industry. Um, and I feel really strongly that if you can give your business to an independent bookstore, you will make a friend for life. You know, it will become a second home to you. If you cannot, if you don't have a good independent bookstore, any bookstore online or in person will suffice. So it's available everywhere. You can get it in, you know, ebook, you can get it in hardcover, you can get it in audio. It's available everywhere. So anywhere that works for you is my answer. Okay, great. And this is your third book, right? Yes, this is my third book. All right, so I, now I'm going backwards. So I get to yes. get the last plate. And what's the one before the last plate? The first book I wrote is called The Ones We Choose. It's not a thriller. It's about a geneticist who conceives her son via donor. She chooses to be a single mom, not by divorce or death, but because she wanted to be a single mom and sort of how that, how that plays out. All right, well, I'm going to go get those other two books. And thank, thank you. you so much, Julie. Thanks so much for having me. It's good to talk to you. All right, you too. Take Bye, care. Everyone. Bye.